Uh, operator, if you would please queue up the questions from folks on the telephone, and if you would please start with um, members of government organizations, government officials. Uh, as soon as you have the first one queued up, we'd appreciate putting that person on. And uh, folks who are asking comments, uh, questions or comments, if you'd please identify yourself and your organization before you make your comment or question, we would appreciate that. You need to go through ground rules. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then one. Please be sure to unmute your phone and record your first and last name, clearly when prompted. If you are a government official, please identify yourself as such. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. If you decide at any point you would like to withdraw your question, you may press star two. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one and identify yourself as a government official. First question comes from Daniel Mills from California Energy Commission. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for including us in this uh, conference. I appreciate it. Um, my question is with regard to um, PG&E's request for enforcement discretion, and, and they discuss the significance of the violation and, and mention that there's a very low mobile transient population. I'm just curious to what extent the NRC is um, looking at the estimated number of endangered citizens and the probability of, it, of an event. Emergency preparedness is a defense in depth measure. You know, uh, uh, we look at uh, 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 the plants are designed to ensure that there is not an event that would result in a significant radiological release. Notwithstanding, the emergency preparedness function uh, is there to provide that defense in depth. So we don't look at it in the context of the probability of, uh, of uh, whether there would be uh, uh, an accident at the plant that would require evacuation. We have, uh, if you will, deterministic requirements whereby the uh, licensee has to meet our uh, uh, emergency planning standards and, and meet uh, the requirements and the regulations uh, specific to the emergency preparedness function. So it's not a matter of, of whether there are, you know, 10 boats uh, that would be on the ocean or whether uh, we're talking about the densely populated area. The licensee has to develop protective action recommendations that are a function of the direction of the radiological plume and uh, the projected uh, dose assessment. Uh, 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 and then uh, communicate those recommendations to the county so that the county can make uh, an informed protective action decision. Thank you. It's very helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ron Oslo, San Luis Obispo and County OES. Your line is open. Thank you. And uh, actually, I failed to uh, identify myself as a government agency, and so I just have some additional input on the conversation. Should I make that now, or should I get back in queue uh, re representing a government entity? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I just wanted to mention, uh, and for clarification for those that don't know, um, San Luis Obispo County is the lead off-site response organization um, for Diablo Canyon. And we do work closely with Diablo Canyon, and in this case, um, with the U.S. Coast Guard. And I uh, wanted to fill in a couple of, uh, of things that, uh, that I heard, and one in particular regarding uh, five miles versus ten miles. And I wanted to note that um, within our procedures, <clears throat> our standard operating guidance that we use uh, for Diablo Canyon Emergency response is uh, one of our um, guidelines is establishing a nautical safety zone and uh, to do so you know we we pass the information through to the Coast Guard and the request that we make is um, our, our predetermined that you know check the box if you will is um, five five nautical mile safety zone 10 nautical mile safety zone, other, and then it goes on to you know note the downwind sectors and uh, and other things. And um, uh, tied in with that is um, 
for those that aren't aware, I, I would understand in this case that most on the line are aware that as the lead offsite response organization, um, we make the protective action decision. In that case, we being uh, the county of San Luis Obispo. And so, as noted throughout, um, whether or not we got a protective action recommendation um, based on the on the situation, you know, we could make and we have in exercises and would make in an event of necessary a pad a protective action decision um, on our own without any input from the utility if uh, if need be. And we actually practice that, and we study up for that. Um, and in fact, um, to keep us uh, aware of what's going on and, and how things work, we have uh, the uh, FEMA um, uh, FEMA's um, uh, radiological protection course. That uh, it's actually the radiological accident assessment course. That in the past, we've sent people down to to Georgia for, and instead of sending one or two people down to Georgia, um, the the course is being hosted here this week. So we have our folks, some of our offsite folks um, in the FEMA course, about 25 people, our pollution control district, um, Cal OES is in there, this is the State Emergency Management Agency, California Department of Public Health, FEMA, NRC, and even a person from Delaware. And this is ongoing, you know, so we look on our own independently of what's going on offsite, what happened to the plant, what other actions might we, might we need to pick, take other than the PARs. Um, and so we coordinate also with all the offsite response organizations, the other organizations, including the Coast Guard. So we may maintain and edit and keep, in this case, the Coast Guard SOP, as well as we do with the Sheriff's Department and schools and all that. It's their SOP, but we edit it so we have one centralized point, so we want to make sure that what's in the Coast Guard SOP is consistent with what's in the rest of our SOPs and so on. Um, so I just wanted to add those points that, uh, as the NRC has already pointed out, at uh, no time was the uh, public health and safety uh, threatened out in the ocean. Well, thank you, Mr. Oswalt. Uh, this is Mark Dupont. I just was going to uh, underscore uh, what I think was your overarching conclusion that the public health and safety was not at risk as uh, by virtue of the uh, process uh, and role that the county uh, would exercise, as you described. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Richard Gunstrom from FEMA. Your line is now open. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this really maybe not be a question, but it's kind of a comment. You know, we've uh, evaluated the offsite response organizations for a long time there at San Luis Obispo. In the EOF, in the county EOC, it's in the same building, the, they have a unified dose assessment uh, center. And both the utility, the county, and the state, they all participate in developing protective action. Uh, recommendations, and then they provide their recommendations to their decision makers, turning into a decision. And you know, you say the uh, utility hasn't had it in their procedure, but they are part of that unified dose assessment center, and they participate in that protective action recommendation, including the part about making protective action recommendations for the uh, boating public or out in the ocean. They're included in that process. So I think that's kind of a, a mitigating factor that you need to consider. Well, thank you for your comment. I think that is consistent with the description provided by uh, uh, the licensee and that there is that collaboration and discussion that occurs uh, as part of the uh, exercises which uh, underscores uh, the licensee's uh, view that uh, uh, protective action recommendation may very well have been generated. Uh, I think the salient point from the NRC perspective is that uh, we expect the emergency preparedness uh, implementing procedures to specifically cull out that uh, process step uh, 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 to ensure that that does in fact occur. Uh, certainly do appreciate though the perspective that you provided based on uh, your own interactions uh, in the uh, licensees EOF and uh, uh, joint, if you will, uh, county uh, um, EOC. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last government question. Our next question comes from Ray Lutz from Citizen, Citizens Oversight. Your line is now open. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm with Citizens Oversight, and our primary mission is civic engagement. Um, I have a few comments and questions. First of all, slide six in the, um, in the package that you provided to the public was, was blank. It had the headers and footers but there was no figure on it. Uh, we, uh, I think that this meeting, uh, the fact that it's not being held, 
within the public education area, despite the fact that success in dealing with emergency scenarios relies upon actions by the public, is pretty astounding. Are you holding this meeting over in, in Texas? That doesn't allow the public to engage very effectively with your process. I did make a written complaint to the NRC on this point, and there was no changes made to the location. And I would assert that in the future, the NRC, in order to um, to actually um, you know fulfill your obligations to engage with the public in this in public engagement education area, you need to hold your meetings either in that area or very close to it. Another thing I submit that you should not close your meeting prior to hearing from the public. The, the public interaction is a very important part of your meeting, and you should not uh, blow it off as not part of the meeting. You already closed the business portion of your meeting without even hearing from the public. Shame on you. Now, uh, no changes. Um, I didn't notice any comments about lessons from Fukushima in this emergency action plan. Um, the thing that concerns me here is that it took almost 10 years to detect a violation from 2005. Despite saying that there, the public was not put at risk, uh, the fact is, is that your root cause analysis identified the fact that you made changes to your plan that were then in, in, missing from the written uh, version of the plan, and you didn't, didn't figure that out for 10 years. The question that everybody needs to ask, what other parts of your plan are missing that you're not catching and that we may not see for another 10 years? What is it about your procedure in uh, making such changes is broken? And that root cause analysis of going back to find out what you did uh, back in 2005, why did this happen, that you could make a change and nobody's caught it? Is it because you don't have a review committee? Is it because you just have a few people making changes willy-nilly and that 10 years later you might find out? Um, it's very concerning to the public that, at least from my view, that you can, uh, you can miss this for 10 years. And uh, I, I am uh, astounded that the NRC can sit here at, without even finishing your meeting and say that the public was not put at risk because they can't find their own mistakes. Of course the public is being put at risk by this process that you have in place where you can make a mistake and not catch it for 10 years. That's the problem. I'm not talking about the mistake of whether voters are out there or not. I'm talking about the mistake of taking this out of your plan and not catching it. That's the mistake. How many other things have been taken out of the plan and not caught? That's the problem. And that could be putting people at risk because I'll tell you what, you don't know what those things are. And it's very clear from the discussion that I heard today that the NRC itself is not adequately reviewing these plans. You're relying upon PG&E, the operator of the plant, to make their own plans and to evaluate their, their, their emergency plans themselves and then come to you if they find a problem and say, please give me a fine, or by the way, give me discretion, don't give me a fine or anything. I found something and I'm gonna give it to you, but make sure that I don't get anything past the green. When in reality, you guys, the NRC, who are sitting here um, happily reviewing the fact that they're not even able to catch something for 10 years, you're not reviewing their plans either. That is amazing to me. The root cause, um, now, has the root cause been corrected? The root cause that I'm talking about is the missing of this back in 2005, not the fact that, the, that, that, that maybe the boats were going to be told to get out of the area. That's not the concern. The concern is that that was eliminated from the plan and not caught for 10 years. Uh, now, this 
voluntary uh, self-assessment is nice, but it didn't detect it for a very long time. And the NRC is relying upon this group to do self-assessments versus check it yourself. How, how can we rely upon the operator to always come forward and self-assess themselves and catch everything? This is a big, this is a big issue. It's the same issue that happened in San Onofre with the steam generators. They self-assessed and said, we don't need to do a 50-59 uh, review. We don't need to submit that to the NRC. Fine, we don't do it. Then we're stuck with a $3.3 billion bill over here. And the inspector general report on the whole process was that you guys at the NRC were not doing an adequate job of reviewing um, the 5059. And here, again, we're seeing something where you're relying upon the operator of this plant to do their own self-internal reviews and say that everything is fine. And you sit there during the meeting and say, there's no problem with what they did. Ridiculous. You shouldn't be making that conclusion when you haven't even gotten to the root cause of what happened here. Now, um, expending, I hear this, we're expending significant resources to make sure everything is handled. Well, maybe, but I haven't heard what changes you're making to your process so that you're not going to miss stuff anymore. I haven't heard what the NRC is doing so that they can catch it. Uh, the evacuation six miles out into the ocean, how come that's not 10 miles? Uh, the, uh, I was reading here from the um, <clears throat> GRO, the General Accounting Office in GAO 13-243, it says now that they want a 50 mile ingestion exposure pathway emergency planning zone. Where is your 50 mile ingestion exposure pathway emergency planning zone? Have you taken that into account? This is what the General Accounting Office is expecting now. According to this guidance, the principal health risk in this zone is exposure from ingesting contaminated water or foodstuffs such as milk, fresh vegetables, or fish. In this pathway, health risks would come from longer-term problems associated with contaminated food and water. I didn't hear any talk about a 50-mile um, ingestion exposure pathway. I didn't hear any talk in this discussion about the changes from Fukushima and what's going to happen due to the fact that when they analyzed the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant with this, a similar uh, failure that occurred at Fukushima, which, by the way, they all said, we have defense and death and nothing will happen, that in this uh, analysis done at Stanford, they determined that the nuclear radiation would actually come all the way down the coast due to the due to the weather conditions all the way to San Diego. So the 10 mile area isn't enough, and the fact that the General Accounting Office is saying 50 miles is necessary, that that's not in your plan. I am very concerned that these plans are not being reviewed, and that the NRC is just passing the buck down to the operator of the plant and say, "You guys analyze your own plan and tell us if it's bad." And then they say everything's fine, and you, you repeat that in the meeting, everything's fine. Mr. Lutz, this is Mark DePaul. I'd like an opportunity uh, to comment on a number of the uh, areas that you provided a comment. I, I do appreciate uh, your comments. I, I'm pretty much done, just so I've finished my list of things. So, yeah, but I, I would like to re maybe respond after you're done. Go ahead. Okay, I, I would like to give others uh, an opportunity to ask questions, and certainly uh, as there's time, we would come back to any uh, further questions that you have. But uh, first thing, uh, thank you for pointing out that uh, slide six uh, did not, uh, the content for whatever reason was not included in what we provided on the website. We'll correct that and make sure a, a full set of slides is provided and we'll verify uh, that the content is visible. Um, I made the decision not to change uh, the location of the venue uh, based on discussion with our program office, the Office of Enforcement. And the reason for that is because this is a, a pre-decisional conference here, a conference for us to discuss with the licensee and understand their perspective on the apparent violation. No decision has been made. That is different than other public meetings that we would conduct uh, where we're communicating the results of regulatory decisions here. Once we conclude our deliberations and determine what is the appropriate enforcement action, we are certainly can talk about that, for example, in the context of the public meeting that we would have in the vicinity of the plant to discuss our overall 
overall assessment of licensee performance, and that would include uh, any findings that are greater than green or any apparent violations, but that would be at a point in time where we certainly have rendered a regulatory conclusion. The other reason why I decided not to ship the uh, venue here was the recognition that, that uh, to be consistent with how we have historically treated all regulatory conferences, and that's that the licensee comes to our house, if you will, to discuss with us uh, uh, their perspective on the uh, particular apparent violation or uh, uh, preliminarily uh, greater than green findings, and that's consistent with how we have treated regulatory conferences uh, across all four regions, including regions uh, with, that have sites that have the same uh, high degree of uh, uh, external stakeholder involvement. Um, um, and, and so that was the uh, pr principal reason for uh, why uh, we decided uh, not to, or I decided not to change the venue. We did look at uh, web streaming, which is something that I would like to pursue in the future, and we face some technical difficulties with the ability to implement web streaming, and we're looking at what we can do uh, to uh, provide uh, the web streaming capability with future meetings. Uh, I appreciate your comments about lessons from Fukushima. Um, um, I will offer that uh, we, the NRC, have looked very seriously at uh, lessons from the uh, Fukushima uh, accident, and we have required a number of things of licensees and issued orders in terms of mitigating strategies. There are actions that licensees need to take in the context of emergency preparedness, and we will hold licensees accountable uh, as we review the uh, responses uh, to those uh, requirements uh, that we issued uh, following our a task force review of the uh, uh, Fukushima lessons learned. Um, um. I, I agree uh, with your characterization that this was an issue that uh, remained unidentified for a significant period of time. I, I think we very clearly heard the licensee explain their extent of cause and extent of condition reviews, uh, and that is certainly, a, uh, it is important that the licensee understands uh, why did they not identify this in an earlier time frame and what are the organizational learnings, and, and quite frankly, by the same token, we did not identify that via our inspection process. It's a sampling inspection process. But the entire regulatory framework is based upon the precedent here that the licensee is responsible for ensuring the safety and security of the facilities. And our inspection program is a sampling program to verify that the licensee is doing that. And yes, there are going to be instances where licensees miss things. It's important once those issues are identified that we assess the safety significance of that issue, determine what is the appropriate regulatory action to preclude recurrence, and a good performance licensee would do the same thing within their organization in terms of lessons learned. Um, uh, you, you did make some comments regarding uh, the emergency plan and uh, you know the degree of review that we conduct. Uh, when, when a facility is licensed, we do look at the emergency plan and we render an overarching conclusion on whether we agree with that. Our regulations are structured to allow a licensee to make changes to their emergency plan. They evaluate that and determine whether there is a reduction in effectiveness associated with that. Uh, and then we do, on a sampling basis, uh, look at those 5054Q evaluations to determine whether the licensee uh, uh, made the appropriate uh, conclusion. And that's exactly why we're here today uh, having this discussion, because here is an instance where the licensee did not conduct that 5054Q review appropriately. Uh, and, and I acknowledge uh, your comments about uh, San Onofre and the Inspector General Review in the uh, context of the 5059. There are some learnings for us. We have a comprehensive lessons learned review that we're conducting to look at whether our guidance to inspectors needs to be enhanced uh, regarding our review of licensee 5059s. Uh, but again, I want to come back to the principal responsibility does rest with uh, the licensee, and it is through that sampling inspection program that we feel uh, that we conduct enough inspection to validate that the licensee is, in fact, uh, 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 executing that responsibility uh, in the manner that it should be. Uh, I'm not sure I understood your thoughts about the 50-mile ingestion pathway. There is a 50-mile ingestion pathway that the licensee is responsible uh, to address, and there are exercises that are conducted that address the ingestion pathway. So uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of uh, the licensee not having that in place. I'm quite confident they do because there is a requirement to that effect. So those are some of my uh, thoughts regarding the uh, comments and questions that you raise, and, and I do appreciate your engagement and your uh, sharing your perspective. If I could ask the operator 
to uh, uh, queue up any other questions that others would have. And, and Mr. Lutz, I certainly welcome coming back to any additional comments you have once we've heard from some other folks. Thank you. Absolutely. Our next question comes from Lynn Walter, private citizen. Your line is open. Thank you. And I just want to offer, um, I, I appreciate the previous comment, but I'm sitting here in my home in Avila, and I, I like the fact that I can participate in this meeting and listen to what's being said. Actually, I think I hear things better uh, in this teleconference than in a, you know, a noisy room, noisier room. I also like the fact that I didn't have to drive, that I didn't have to find a parking place, and I didn't have to, I had the uh, ability to sit in a comfortable chair. So I just wanted to put a counter uh, opinion um, on the record about I think this teleconference worked really well. I appreciate being able to participate in this way. And I uh, did queue up on my computer just for information that I did get uh, slide six. I got the map, and it was pretty clear on my computer. So I'm not sure that the problem is at your end. Uh, maybe it's uh, just a difference in technology. Anyway, um, uh, my question is that uh, I heard a lot of comments from the NRC and questions from the NRC to pg e about the important benchmarking. And at one point, I heard the NRC mention about their experience in Region 1 um, as, a, as an obvious you know, well, you know, obviously over water is, is um, an important part of your circle on your map. But, you know, I, I wonder if the NRC is asking itself the same question of itself, um, internal benchmarking. Um, and, uh, at, in, in fact, the, the, the regulations that have increasingly got more clear more clarity, Red Guide 1.129, the recent EP rulemaking. It's, it seems to underscore to me that the state that we were in in the early 80s and 2005 is a different state of clarity than we are right now because we have Fukushima lessons. So we are getting clearer and we are getting more aware. Um, so, but there's a complicit. A, a, a complicit nature that the NRC has in this. I haven't heard the NRC um, admit to their own failings of internal benchmarking here, which I, I clearly see. And that's, that's my question. Yeah, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, uh, I do think uh, uh, that benchmarking is very important. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm the one that made the comment regarding uh, the experience in Region 1 where there are facilities, this is Mark Depod, there are facilities uh, that uh, are uh, uh, located along the coast and do have protective action recommendation uh, process uh, for areas over the ocean. Uh, uh, and, and I do think the licensee acknowledged that uh, or did a, you know, indicate that they identified this deficiency as a result of the benchmarking that was conducted. Uh, but uh, getting to your point about uh, internal benchmarking, it, it is an important uh, process. And I wanted to mention uh, that there is a, uh, 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 a review that we are subject to uh, two years ago. It's called an International Regulatory Review Service Mission, where the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, uh, sends a team consisting of uh, experts from uh, regulatory organizations at, uh, in various countries. And they look very critically at the uh, NRC's uh, regulatory structure and how we implement our programs and processes and then provide uh, recommendations and observations and then we address those and we did receive a, a comprehensive review and there were some uh, recommendations uh, that were provided that resulted in us uh, uh, revisiting and making changes to uh, some of our processes. And then of course we, we do have the Office of the Inspector General and, and that office uh, clearly uh, uh, you know conducts audits and evaluations of NRC programs and processes and over the years has provided a number of recommendations and observations and findings and has resulted in clear action uh, by uh, the NRC uh, to uh, improve its uh, programs and processes. And then, of course, we do have self-assessments that we conduct uh, similar to the industry that has self-assessments, but uh, we do try and look at critically in those areas. And specific to the regions, we have the program officers.
offices at headquarters that conduct evaluations of the regions uh, to determine uh, uh, how we are implementing the uh, programs and processes that are defined uh, by those uh, headquarters offices. So I do think there is a fair amount of uh, introspection and evaluation regarding how we're doing, as well as uh, external reviews. And, and some of those external reviews can include uh, government accountability office uh, reviews, GAO reviews, and we have re received a number of recommendations. And, 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 and collectively, all of those point to there are opportunities for us to improve uh, how we uh, execute the regulatory mission. Uh, 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 but I'm not aware of uh, any uh, overarching review that reached a conclusion that we are not uh, fulfilling our statutory mandate to uh, ensure uh, protection of public health and safety by virtue of our inspection and licensing programs. But certainly our opportunities to enhance those processes to make them as efficient and effective as they can be. Uh, but I do appreciate your question and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Dan Hirsch from the University of California. Your line is now open. Thanks very much. I have two questions, if I may. Um, it was said um, early in the um, meeting today and also in the press release that the NRC issued about this meeting that um, this uh, issue that arose had no immediate safety significance because, quote, at no time was the public going to be allowed to stay in an area that had the potential for radioactivity if an event had occurred. And the basis for that is the citation to the fact that the county had its procedure and the U.S. Coast Guard had its. But I am confused by the radius of these procedures. In the actual inspection report, the finding was that um, PG&E had eliminated procedures uh, for guidance or requirements for developing and communicating protective action requirements for areas of the Pacific that lie within the 10-mile emergency planning zone. Um, it goes on to say that um, this was a degradation rather than a complete loss of protection because the county, quote, has procedures which include a default action to recommend that the U.S. Coast Guard evacuate waterborne vessels within five nautical miles if the licensee notifies the county of a general emergency, and that the U.S. Coast Guard has additional guidance recommending a two nautical mile safety zone for an alert or site area emergency. So the issue seemed to be this zone between five nautical miles and 10 regular miles, which um, represents actually the majority of the ocean area. And the uh, inspection report goes on to say the required planning standard function was degraded because the licensee's procedures did not direct the licensee to issue appropriate protective action recommendations to cover affected areas over the ocean within five to ten miles of the site. The planning standard function was degraded rather than lost because default procedural actions of local governments would have resulted in effective protection, protective actions for areas within five miles of the site. So this is my first question. I have one other, but um, I wonder if that could be explained to us. Um, it appears as though protections within five nautical miles were still in place, um, and therefore no immediate safety concern regarding the area within five nautical miles. But as I read your inspection report, it sounds as though there may have been uh, situations in which boats, and obviously the people on those boats and ships between five and ten miles, might not have, in fact, um, been uh, removed from the area. If I heard the uh, official from the county correctly, it sounds as though their procedure is that they have a default, which is what the, your inspection report says, of five nautical miles, but do have other boxes that they can check, 10 miles or other. But it would appear that the loss of pg and procedure for making recommendations to the county 
would have degraded the county's ability to choose a box other than the default. And your own inspection report seems to make clear that the uh, zone from 5 to 10 miles was an area in which um, that protection was degraded. So perhaps someone could answer that, and then I do have one other question, if I may. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Hirsch. This is Mark Pop. We could answer that, and then uh, we would, we'll give you the opportunity to ask your second question. I'm going to ask uh, Mark Hare, who is the branch chief that uh, signed out the uh, actual inspection report, to uh, speak to the areas uh, that you uh, just described in your question. Thank you. Yeah, this is Mark Hare, and I'll just uh, attempt to address that question in a couple of ways. The first is uh, there's the 10-mile requirement is is the requirement. So when we when we look at the emergency plan, we ask ourselves, does it meet the requirement to provide for protective action recommendations, instructions for protective action recommendations for the entire 360 degrees, all the way out to 10 miles. So when we looked at this, we said this is a non-compliance because their procedure removed the instructions to cover out to 10 miles for over the ocean. Uh, so, so the non-compliance was identified. Then the question we began to ask was, what is the significance of this non-compliance? What was the safety impact of this non-compliance? And that's when we get into the question of what other layers of protection and what other uh, elements of this can we, can we look at to, de to decide what is the significance? So when we're asking ourselves, was it a degraded uh, planning standard or was it a lost planning standard or was there what was the impact on the planning standard we're asking ourselves what is the significance of the non-compliance we've already established they don't meet the requirement out to 10 miles so when we're looking at the significance uh, some of the things that we look at I've, I, I talked about earlier we look at what was the licensee's capability they had a demonstrated capability through drills and exercises over uh, all of the years that they've been operation we observe those regularly they've demonstrated the ability to assess radiological conditions 360 degrees they've demonstrated the ability to assess a release, to assess wind direction, to assess dose consequences. So whether the wind direction was pointed over the ocean or over the land, they had the capability to make that assessment. The second aspect is they had the capability to engage and notify the off-site agencies. So they had demonstrated that because all of their drills and exercises, again, demonstrated their capability to interact effectively with the, the, the uh, local government agencies, in, in this case, the, the county. The county had a relationship with the Coast Guard. The utility had a relationship with the Coast Guard as well. So they had those demonstrated abilities to interact and communicate, uh, irrespective of the fact that they lost one of their defense and de depth elements because they didn't have uh, the over the ocean area proceduralized. They still had all these other capabilities that they could have relied on. And then in third, we, we noted that there were default actions already in place, which effectively protected the public by default out to five nautical miles because of the actions that the Coast Guard and the county had in place regardless of whether the licensee had been able to make a protective action recommendation or not. So in recognition of those factors and in addition uh, what Mr. Gunstrom pointed out in his comment earlier that the uh, emergency facilities are co-located so that there's significant interaction between the county uh, folks who are involved in dose assessment and the utility folks that are involved in dose assessment, that it's reasonable to conclude that the right decision for the public would have been made all the way out to 10 miles and beyond if the site conditions had warranted it. Still, nonetheless, we document the apparent violation because the licensee's procedures, uh, that's a layer of defense and depth that we require, the procedures did not have uh, the instructions appropriate to cover those areas. I hope that uh, clarified and answered the question of what's the difference between the five and the 10 miles. Well, it troubles me, frankly. I mean, uh, um, I think you have a, a logical disconnect in the inspection report and in this decision to then determine that, um, quote, unquote, um, at no time was the public going to be allowed to stay in an area that had the potential for radioactivity if an event had occurred. And the significance of their failure is that there was a zone from 5 to 10 nautical miles for which there wasn't coverage. And maybe we would have gotten lucky, and in the midst of the emergency, someone would have figured out there was a problem and gotten the right recommendation in. But that's not how we want to do things. I mean, you all remember the extraordinary real-life confusion that occurred at the time of Three Mile Island. 
So you want those procedures in place so a very clear recommendation can be made to the county so it doesn't check the box five miles but checks the 10-mile box. I just would suggest that um, your press release and the uh, inspection report are not uh, entirely consistent and clear on this matter, um, and there was an area that was potentially uncovered by this uh, change. My second question has to do with your conclusion that there are no cross-cutting issues here. I was troubled in the, listening to your conversation. I want to applaud those, whoever it was from the NRC who um, managed to get this matter acknowledged, that this was not the only such incident in which a 50-54 problem had arisen regarding uh, changes to the emergency plan, and that uh, PG&E has now acknowledge that they have confusion in their uh, licensing basis regarding the emergency plan and are about to or have commenced a licensing basis verification project similar to what they have done for uh, other aspects of the licensing basis. And I wonder if you at NRC could just summarize for a moment that larger LBVP and the um, discoveries that have occurred through it regarding other changes to the facility over the last decades that were not done to the actual licensing basis, and they're now having to go back and uh, revisit and reanalyze, particularly you know on the seismic side, um, because it would seem to me those would be very troubling to an inspector, to a regulator, that there had been so many years of changes made without meeting the actual licensing basis, and that those discoveries are occurring belatedly and they're having to go back retroactively to do new analyses. And it would seem to me that there is a larger cross-cutting issue here of a unclear licensing basis in many, many regards and numerous changes that have been made to the facility over the years that did not take into account the actual current licensing basis. And Mr. Hirsch, this is Mark DePa. Uh, um, I am aware that the licensee is engaged in a licensing basis verification project that is separate and apart from the EP functional area. As with any one of these licensing basis verification project efforts, uh, you know, we are aware by virtue of our inspection activities and our on-site uh, uh, resident presence of uh, any significant uh, findings that are coming out of those projects and we would assess the uh, significance of those in the same context that we're doing here today with the uh, licensee identified uh, 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 deficiency here associated with the change to the emergency plan implementing procedure. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand the uh, basis for saying that there are significant uh, deficiencies that exist in the licensing basis here that you uh, indicated. Uh, I, I, I'm, 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 it's not apparent to me. I'll give that out for a moment. My understanding is to give two examples that the steam generator replacements and the vessel head replacements were done to the wrong seismic basis, that they had to go back, they discovered they hadn't done it to the appropriate seismic basis, and tried to reevaluate to determine whether or not, even though they hadn't designed it for the appropriate seismic challenge, they were still okay. And that's true not just for those two significant features, but for many other changes that have occurred over the decades. It would seem to me that that would suggest an underlying problem rather than individual problems. That's what we're talking about in terms of cross-cutting. An underlying problem of not having kept a very clear licensing basis and having made many changes to the facility without doing 50-54 or 50-59 analyses, and after the fact, with some embarrassment, having to go back and try to, uh, to say, well, if we had done the analysis at the time, um, it would still have been okay. It just seems to me you have a generic underlying potential problem here. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that additional context. Uh, the one example you're referring to obviously uh, deals with the licensee replacing the steam generator and reactor vessel head and not accounting for the uh, ground accelerations that would be uh, evident from the Ahasgri event coupled with loss of coolant accident loads to determine uh, uh, whether that exceeded the uh, uh, ASME code allowables. The licensee did evaluate 
the uh, double design earthquake uh, uh, plus uh, loss of coolant accident loads, as I know you are aware. Uh, uh, however, they did not address uh, Hosgree plus uh, loss of coolant accident or local to licensee. Did identify that in, I think it was May 2011, as a result of their licensing basis verification project, uh, and then did a, conduct an evaluation of that as found condition and determined that the steam generator uh, uh, in this example had sufficient uh, uh, margin such that there was not uh, a concern with the ability of that particular uh, uh, component to withstand those forces. Uh, we looked at the, oper the operability of determination, which is the licensee's evaluation of that, and determined we did not have a, a, safety, sig uh, a safety concern. Uh, the licensee has subsequently uh, conducted another 50-59 evaluation uh, for that configuration, and we are evaluating that at this point in time. But I do think that is an example of something that did come out of a licensing basis verification project. But your point I do appreciate is that it is important that we as a regulator step back and look at that. If there's an example there, are there other examples uh, that would cause us to question to what degree is the licensee rigorously uh, uh, implementing the 5059 process? We do have an inspection that looks at that and uh, we make draw conclusions uh, based on the particular 5059 evaluations that we look at as a sampling and then if there problems, we expand the scope uh, to be able to reach an informed assessment regarding the veracity of that uh, program and how it's implemented. But but it's not lost on me that we do need to look at it in a cross-cutting manner, and I would offer that our inspection program does do that. I don't want to belabor it, so just one last point. I think the point I'm trying to make is not that once they went back and looked, they lucked out and um, their analysis w and whether this is an accurate analysis or not, let's put that aside. They now claim that, okay, if we had done it for the Hosby, we still would have been okay. I think there's a fundamental concern about a facility that could operate for so long and be making major changes to the facility based on the wrong licensing basis, in this case, the wrong seismic load. And therefore, to say that this particular incident that we've just had of the change to the emergency plan is an isolated matter not connected to others, when they have apparently two others on the emergency plan side, and my understanding is many, many on the uh, structural side, the steam generators and, and um, uh, um, vessel head being just two troubling examples. So it's not the specific fact whether or not the steam generator is or is not okay or the vessel head is or is not okay. It's a fundamental matter that you could go that many years making that many changes to the wrong li using the wrong licensing basis. Yeah, thanks for that. So I, thank you. I, I appreciate the comments. I, I think we need to be careful when you make broad statements like many, many. Uh, I think the facts... Well, let me ask one favor then on that. It would be very helpful for the NRC and the licensee to release um, publicly the full details of the LBVP, um, what they've looked at, what was found. Um, I think um, if you feel that there really have been only a couple of examples, then that um, would be clear from that public transparency. If there have been many, people should know that as well. So let me just make that as a request or a recommendation that they, that full LBVP, um, uh, the documents regarding it, um, what led to it, what they've analyzed, what they found, that should all be made public. I appreciate uh, your request, and that's really a decision for the licensee. I'll offer that we do look at the issues that do uh, uh, that are. Uh, uh, identified by virtue of the LBVP uh, 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 and determine uh, the, our own independent review and assessment the degree to which we think those are significant and those reviews are uh, documented in our inspection reports. Uh, so that that's uh, how you can obtain some insights uh, regarding uh, uh, what the licensee is identifying and what our independent assessment is of the safety significance uh, of those findings. Of course, that is uh, based on licensee communicating to us the results of their LBVP and quite frankly the licensee has a responsibility to communicate to the regulator significant findings deriving from that where there is a safety question or 
where there is a, a degraded margin, et cetera. So uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd leave you with that. I do appreciate that's your my comments. That's the question. Yeah, what well, you have, what NRC has, should be made public. But more than that, my understanding is that when you review things, generally PG&E holds on to what you're reviewing, and therefore it's not made publicly available. But if they had given it to you, if you ask for it, then it needs to be made publicly available. And I think that would be a very useful thing for your region to do. Uh, this should not be done behind um, a, a curtain. I think there really needs to be some uh, ability for the public to scrutinize. So anyway, thank you very much. Well, thank you for your comment, and I think your last statement refers to uh, if we are in possession of documents and we have a Freedom of Information Act request, we make those documents available, but the licensee uh, uh, can communicate why those documents are considered proprietary, and there's a process we go through to determine whether that is the appropriate characterization. I, I do appreciate your comments, though, Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, and, and let me ask the operator to uh, 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 provide uh, or, or connect us with uh, any other individuals that have questions. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ace Hoffman from Nuke Free North County. Your line is open. Uh, hi. Thank you very much for taking my call. Uh, just a couple of short things. Um, th there's no discussion here. The licensee is, uh, in, is supposed to be taking the initiative on a lot of different steps, and the NRC backs off and says, we have a sampling program. But who decides that the 10-mile limit is the right limit? Isn't it time that we reconsider that? Uh, okay, so that's too big for this little project, maybe. But if we did, that 130 sound systems or whatever the number was is going to explode very, very rapidly, which relates to whether or not, you know, because as you go out on a, on a circle, the, the number goes up by, you know, the square. Um, so fishermen in the 5 to 10 mile region, what about the 10 to 12 mile region or the 12 to 15? How many fishermen are there? And is there any chance we're talking about sacrificing uh, that, that somebody might get hurt? In which case, this is really a very serious thing, and I think I'm, what I'm hearing is it's, it's, not, it's not significant because there are so many uh, more, the, the population is so much greater elsewhere uh, in the, on the land areas. So there's very few fishermen comparatively, but there's still people there. They're, they are people. So um, let's get to the sampling program. You, you, you described the NRC's job as a sampling program, and I wonder if with a 10-year wait it's effective. I would think that to be effective, there have to be surprise visits, and occasionally these have to be microscopic visits that not only make the utility think that uh, you might look at anything or everything, uh, but also that they have no idea when it's coming, and it gives a check on whether or not your sampling programs are actually effective. And you can't do that without an enormous, I mean, everybody would hear about it. They're, the NRC is doing that. This is the month that they came and did that to San Onofre. What, what did it have happened? So those are all of my comments, and thank you again very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Mr. Hoffman, and I do appreciate your acknowledging the opportunity we're providing here to engage members of the public. That's an important part of uh, being open and transparent in our processes. Uh, I'll just comment uh, on the uh, emergency planning zone or EPZ size. There have, uh, as you, I'm sure you're aware, there have been uh, extensive engagement with the NRC about the need to revisit the size of the EPZ. There have been a number of studies that have been published that would that would indicate that the uh, current 10-mile emergency planning zone is sufficient uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the protective action decisions that would be implemented would result in uh, uh, protections for the public. Again, the premise uh, with emergency planning is that's the last defense in depth measure there that the design of the facilities and how those facilities are operated are such that you would not, uh, uh, it would be extremely unlikely that you would see a radiological release, release of a magnitude that would require uh, a protective action decision such as sheltering in place or evacuation. Uh, we have as an agency indicated very clearly that uh, if there is new information that indicates the uh, size of the EPZ is not adequate, we will revisit that most recently uh, being the Fukushima accident and, and, and we've acknowledged if there are studies or uh, that would indicate that uh, 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 the current uh, uh, EPZ size is inappropriate, we will look at that new information and, uh, uh, and make decisions accordingly. Um, 
the sampling, let me move on to our inspection program. Uh, yes, it is a sampling program, and, and, and uh, that, that clearly we do not have the resources to do 100% uh, inspection of all activities. Uh, you know, we, we conduct a sampling inspection, and then we draw conclusions based on the results of those inspection activities. You know, our, our, our focus is uh, trust but verify with independent verification through our inspection program. And, and, and when we do miss something, we we look at why and does the inspection guidance need to be enhanced, does the scope of the inspection need to be expanded, and there are a number of instances uh, throughout our regulatory uh, history here where we have made changes to our inspection program. Uh, uh, regarding unannounced inspections, I personally am not convinced that an unannounced inspection will provide you any more information. Uh, you know, if we're looking at uh, a particular program, uh, the fact that we announced that we are planning to look at that, I don't think results in any uh, different uh, 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 insights than if uh, we were to communicate we're conducting an unannounced inspection. Um, um, and there are a, a very selected number of areas where we do have unannounced inspections. Uh, and an example of that can be radiographers. Uh, or materials licensees uh, where we have determined that the unannounced inspection is appropriate. Uh, but I do appreciate your comments and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Don Lightning from Citizens Oversight. Your line is open. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. A couple, uh, two or three uh, items I'd like to bring up. First of all, the slides are very hard to, to look at on, on a computer. So I think a really easy thing to do would be provide a, a web link for each slide. And therefore, when people are looking at the slide, they could also open up a window with a PDF or something of that slide and be able to zoom in or do whatever they want. That would make it much easier to actually see what's going on on. Uh, secondly, um, I'm concerned with the uh, tsunami problems that California may, may face. We all know that, uh, you know, they're one in a thousand or one in a ten thousand year event, but as Fujishima proved, uh, three meltdowns occurred, you know, within a week. So what we have to deal with in California and other places in the U.S. is if nature goes crazy and uh, we have giant gigantic tsunamis coupled with gigantic earthquakes, then what is the plan if, uh, you know, the shit hits the fan? I'm not trying to be cute, but I think that's a apt metaphor. When things that people never predicted in size and mass just crush um, our facilities that are located near the ocean. And uh, well, I got two other things. I'll go over them real quick. One uh, on the surprise inspections. I think it should be uh, appropriate for the NRC when they do these inspections to have the inspectors be from outside whichever NRC region normally uh, inspects that plant. We saw with San Onofre that there was there was a cozy relationship between Region Four and the people that worked at the plant, and that definitely worked against us when we got our uh, replacement steam project. And the other thing I think that needs to be said is that the licensees and the NRC needs to publish how much nuclear waste there is stored at each facility, both in pools and in dry casts. Because as those numbers get bigger and bigger, then I think there should be different levels of scrutiny and different um, circumferences of protection because it becomes an ever bigger potential problem. And thank you for taking my questions. Well, I certainly appreciate your comments. Uh, uh, um, let me attempt to address the, the three comments you provided. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the tsunami hazard, uh, we clearly, uh, as a result of uh, the Fukushima lessons learned, the near-term task force that uh, delivered a, a, a number of recommendations uh, to the commission, and then uh, follow-on review by the NRC staff, there are specific uh, actions or requirements uh, that we have put in place uh, for the industry to address uh, uh, potential hazards from uh, tsunamis or earthquakes. Uh, there's uh, flooding reanalyses that we're required
requiring seismic reanalyses, that we are requiring uh, mitigating strategies to ensure that uh, a utility can address a prolonged loss of off-site power uh, 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 coupled with uh, uh, a significant uh, uh, external event such as an earthquake or a tsunami. So I do think we clearly have, as a result of the uh, Fukushima lessons learned, uh, a number of uh, or various requirements and actions that uh, we have put in place uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the facilities can address uh, those potential hazards. Um, I, I can't speak to the specific example you gave regarding a cozy relationship between the uh, NRC inspectors at San Onofre. You made reference to the STEAM project, quote unquote. Uh, I do think uh, 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 that the inspection staff that we have at the sites are uh, uh, very professional and objective and uh, do conduct uh, their inspection function uh, uh, in an appropriate manner there. Uh, we do have measures in place to ensure that those inspectors at the sites maintain their objectivity with uh, supervisory uh, visits, uh, opportunities for those inspectors to go to other sites and uh, benchmark practices. But uh, And we have a requirement in place for any uh, member of the resident staff. Uh, they have to mandatory rotation at the end of seven years, and that's part of, uh, of the overarching measure we put in place to ensure uh, objectivity. Um, you, you are correct about uh, waste uh, uh, does continue to accumulate at a facility, whether it be uh, fuel, uh, spent fuel stored in the spent fuel, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, spent fuel, uh, uh, spent fuel pool, excuse me, uh, or uh, dry cast storage. Uh, I, I am a strong proponent for uh, the uh, administration and uh, Congress with uh, reaching uh, closure on what will be the permanent solution uh, for uh, high-level waste, whether it be a geological repository or some other means, uh, but that is a matter of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, administration uh, policy as supported by uh, Congress. Uh, but in the meantime, until such a solution is uh, uh, identified and put into place. Uh, our role is to ensure the fuel that is stored on site here in the interim is done so in a safe manner. And uh, I would offer dry cast storage and wet uh, uh, storage uh, are a safe means of storing that uh, fuel until we decide uh, what we will do as a national strategy there with our uh, policy and decision makers that we have elected uh, to our government. Okay, one real quick follow-on question, if I may, uh, about the uh, fuel storage dry cast. It's been shown that the high burn-up fuel, which uh, many reactors are using now, has not been proven safe in dry cast storage for any real length of time. And the NRC, I know, is doing testing and working on that, but uh, for... Uh, people to buy dry cast storage with the expectation that it's going to last 50 or 100 years and perhaps have it fail in just a few years is, is a huge uh, guessing game. And I think the NRC needs to do a lot more about uh, not only speeding up the testing on um, high burn up fuel and how long it lasts in uh, dry cast, but also uh, delay any kind of major approval until they get that testing done, because otherwise they're guessing, and that's not a good thing to do. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I, I am highly confident that our uh, Office of Spent Fuel Storage and Transportation, or Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards, is uh, looking very carefully and thoroughly at uh, the capability for uh, dry cast uh, storage design from the various vendors, uh, whether they can, that can support storage of uh, uh, high, high density or high burn up fuel uh, for a, a, a period of time. We would not license a particular design uh, without the assurance uh, that uh, the storage of that uh, fuel uh, would be done uh, safely. Uh, and uh, as you've indicated, there is testing associated with that, and I certainly would expect uh, us to have a clear understanding of the testing results uh, before we would go forward with any uh, licensing decision. But I do know the storage of high burn-up fuel is something that we are looking at and evaluating and ensuring that uh, uh, before we would authorize any storage of fuel at a facility, in uh, uh, meaning high burn-up fuel in a cast, that uh, those casts can accommodate that fuel in a safe manner.
Well, just to let you know, they're they're starting the approval process at uh, San Onofre for high burn-up fuel since they decommissioned it, and they're looking at some some casts that have not proven they can stand it. So you might uh, check that out when you have some spare time. No, thank you for that, and I, and I just would offer again, we, we are not going to license uh, use of that cast without uh, complete confidence that the uh, fuel the licensee intends to store in that cask can be done uh, safely. This is Great. Mark here. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, would you be interested in sharing your email address in case we'd like to send you uh, specifically some comments? That's fine. Uh, we'll provide you an email address here uh, uh, at the conclusion of our uh, uh, public uh, question and answer period so you can forward any comments that you uh, have. Thank you. This is uh, Mark here with the NRC, and I'd like to add a couple of comments before we move to the next caller. Uh, there were a couple of callers have now commented on their desire for uh, NRC to exercise more surprise inspections, and I would just add that uh, we do have resident inspectors on site at every facility who have unfettered access to the entire facility at any time, day or night, seven days a week, and they do conduct surprise inspections. They show up unannounced at uh, all kinds of activities that are going on at the facility, looking in on various activities. And so to that degree, we, we, we do conduct regular uh, surprise inspections. And, and I would also like to add uh, a response to the previous caller. Mr. Hoffman uh, made a quick comment that uh, would like to address. And he made the comment that he got the impression that our significance determination was related to how many people might potentially be exposed and indicated that we might be sacrificing uh, the safety of some people because there were uh, low population zone, only a few boaters and that sort of thing. And I would just like to respond to that directly and say that uh, the NRC uh, does not base its significance determination on the number of people who are exposed. Our significance determination uh, has to do with the compliance and the safety significance of the non-compliance, as, as I described. And so that, that is not impacted by the number of people who might be impacted by the non-compliance. And, and I would add that uh, some comments were made uh, earlier in the conference to the effect that uh, major drills and exercises tend to focus on the more risk significant higher population zones and I would add that that uh, typically has to do with getting the maximum amount of exercise value because of the number of organizations that are involved in the exercise. There are fewer organizations involved in low population areas than there are in, in, in large population areas. So the focus of exercises that are evaluated typically are addressing uh, getting the maximum value, training value for all the organizations that could be impacted. That's not a statement of, of whether high population or low population zones are significant. Uh, the NRC's significance determination is not affected by the number of people that are impacted. I just wanted to add those two comments. We're ready for the next caller. Thank you. We do have um, one additional question after I introduce this person. Our next question comes from Ray Lutz from Citizen Oversight. Your line is open. Okay, yeah, I just uh, wanted to uh, get closure on a couple of things. I did, I uh, was able to download the PDF and by using, you know, a direct access to that versus going through the browser, it did show up. I wanted to mention that um, my request for a local and in-person meeting did not mean that I didn't expect also that it be used, uh, a teleconference would not be available in that case. I believe that a teleconference should still be available as well as a webcast even if you hold the meeting within a convenient um, area for the public access. And I'd like to uh, underline the point that um, the public, uh, there's other things that happen at these meetings that the public um, makes use of other than the, the official business portion of the meeting. There's a lot of interaction with different members of the public that are coordinating um, their activities, uh, the various um, maybe unofficial responses that uh, groups that are, that are planning to, to, to make plans in the event of emergency, all those things happen on an unofficial level. And so I don't think that you can uh, discount the value of an in-person meeting for uh, something like emergency planning. Um, 
regardless of whether this is customary for the NRC. Uh, there was a comment made by the NRC official saying, well, it's, it's not what we do. It's not our customs. We just don't do it that way. And so, therefore, we're going to continue not doing it that way. Uh, I beg to differ. Um, this needs to change. You guys need to have these meetings in the area, the emergency planning meetings, regardless of what kind it is, whether you're doing a, a so-called regulatory type of meeting like you are right here or something that's, that's uh, you know, intended to be specifically outreach to the public, those things should be in that area. Um, and so that, that um, tradition that you have of holding this meeting in Texas um, should change. Uh, now, finally, I had uh, one more thing. I mentioned that um, there was the question uh, about the um, 50 mile ingestion exposure pathway emergency planning zone. That is an emergency planning zone. And I believe that it should be included on these various maps that you have here. It's not. I don't see an ingestion emergency planning zone included. You asserted in your response to me that it is part of your plan, but then why isn't it on the map? So I, I would like to request that you include that on the map um, so that people can see that that's part of the plan, if it is, um, since I can now see the map. Okay, thank you very much for letting me uh, follow up on those things. Thank you, Mr. Letts. Uh, this is Mark Palm. I'm not sure I'm aware of what you're referring to when you say the map. Uh, is this a... I'm looking at page six. Page six of your handouts, you have an emergency... Pl it's entitled Emergency Planning Zone. There's a map with the various uh, levels, whether it be six mile, 10 mile, state extended, but there is no ingestion pathway zone shown. Yeah, thank do you. Do you understand what I'm speaking about? I, I do now. Thank you. And uh, I'd highlight that that was a slide that was provided by the licensee as part of their presentation today. Uh, uh, so uh, they did not obviously uh, include an indication of the 50 mile uh, uh, gestion pathway uh, EPZ. Uh, I would offer that that would be a 50 mile radius there from the uh, location of Diablo Canyon, but uh, uh, but that was not uh, a product that we provided, but I do now understand your point. Thank you. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with you uh, regarding your comment that if we are engaging in public outreach, we need to do that in the vicinity of the uh, plant, uh, that absolutely. Uh, and I do appreciate your views on uh, 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 why this meeting should have been conducted in the vicinity of, uh, of Diablo Canyon, you know, uh, it, it does underscore, Mr. Lutz, uh, your clear interest in activities at the site in our regulatory uh, uh, role here, and uh, you do want an opportunity to engage us in that regard, and, and I do appreciate the importance of the emergency preparedness function. Uh, we are going to provide uh, members of the public located at the plant with an opportunity to engage us. Uh, we do have some planned uh, uh, public meetings. I, I would like uh, uh, Wayne uh, Walker here, who is the branch chief with the uh, oversight responsibility uh, of the uh, in the inspection program at Diablo Canyon, to just uh, comment on the public meetings that we have planned coming up. Uh, yeah, Mr. Lutz, we're planning, uh, it'll probably be in the April time frame this year, we would be out there. And uh, our current plans are to have some type of like a workshop, which should allow the public to ask uh, really a number of questions regarding um, even some of the issues that have come up today about the licensing basis verification project, about the recent seismic studies that have been um, conducted by the licensee and are ongoing, and some of the reviews that we've done recently. And then, of course, I'm sure you're aware of the 5054F response that's due in uh, March of this uh, year. Um, we'll also be able to discuss some of that that um, will be provided at that time. And then also we'll try and our current planning anyway is we'd probably have our end of cycle meeting at that time also, which would be our assessment of the licensee's performance for this last year. So those are a couple, those are a couple opportunities that should be coming up here in April and we're in the planning stages for that. So just to let you make you aware of that. 
Okay, I just uh, really quick, are you guys coordinating with the Independent Safety uh, uh, Committee that's in place at uh, San Onofre on these issues? I, I guess um, coordination, I, I would say, I don't know if you call it coordination. We're aware of the meetings and we have attended some of the meetings. Chris Smith, uh, an inspector here in the uh, uh, region, has gone to several of those meetings. And also Tom Hipschman, who's the senior resident inspector at uh, Diablo Canyon, he's, he's been actively uh, in communication with the issues that come up at those meetings. Well, I mean, are they reviewing? I mean, this is something that they're, they're supposed to be independent safety. This is a safety issue, and they're supposed to be giving independent review. Are they being provided the opportunity to re provide independent review of this issue that you're talking about today? Is this a state organization? Yeah, yeah, I'm not aware that they're reviewing this issue that we're talking about today. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, the licensee, uh, Mr. Allen, has indicated he can uh, will comment, but I thought that independent organization uh, uh, is a uh, state uh, entity, as I understand it. Yeah, the uh, Diablo Canyon Independent Safety Commission uh, was chartered by the state of California, uh, has composed of uh, three members of uh, very excellent background. Uh, they they uh, have a typically a monthly visit to the station. I think a quarterly public meeting, typically in in Avila, there for the public. Uh, they're completely independent. They look at uh, whatever they want to. They do have a a bit of a program laid out so they get a chance to on some periodicity go through and look at you know most of the major topic areas. They also review our uh, everything in our corrective action program so they can pick and choose. Uh, issues such as this one to take a look at and uh, typically ask us to provide presentations. Yeah, thank you for that, Mr. Allen. Uh, I would offer, too, that this group uh, is on our distribution list for our inspection reports and, and uh, should be aware of uh, the results of our inspection activities. And, and as Mr. Walker said, uh, you know, um, they would be aware that we are conducting a public meeting in the vicinity and are welcome to uh, come and attend and ask any questions that uh, they may have. Uh, but we don't coordinate, quote unquote, if you will, uh, uh, our evaluations of the, uh, as an example, the emergency preparedness function with uh, any uh, 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 review that they might conduct uh, since they are an independent uh, state-sponsored uh, uh, entity. Uh, well, if you're ever shorthanded and you don't have enough manpower to review stuff, maybe you, you might consider coordinating versus just blowing them off. Okay, thank you very much for my, for my questions. Thank you. Our next question comes from Donna Gilmore, and this is our last question. Ms. Gilmore, your line is open. Okay, I'm thank sorry, you. Can you please say where you're calling with? Uh, San Ano for Safety. I'm in California. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, in January, um, I, I noticed you mentioned about the, the CAFs safety, so that makes me think you may have a different emergency plan for that. Um, in January 2014, EPRI uh, inspected uh, a couple of Diablo Canyon canisters. Well, not really inspected. They just checked for some surface particles, found my magnesium chloride, found the temperature on the canisters low enough uh, that there is the potential for uh, uh, chlorine stress corrosion cracking at the canisters at Diablo Canyon now. Uh, given that surprising information, uh, does that potentially trigger any kind of change in your emergency planning procedures? And, and um, you know, because, you know, since you've got other issues with their plan, is this one that may need to be looked at? We're not aware of uh, any uh, degradation to the uh, dry cast storage uh, canisters there. Uh, and, and if there were uh, a degradation, that is certainly a matter that I would expect the licensee to communicate to that. Uh, uh, but let me ask uh, Mr. Allen if he has any comments uh, uh, regarding that. Just, just two comments. Uh, the, uh, the EPRI study is really looking at long-term degradation, right? It's not short-term, near-term. Uh, there is no current degradation. Our operators do inspect that on rounds daily, and they have criteria to inspect and look for, you know, good, uh, robust canisters, and uh, that's it. 
Um, uh, this is Donna Gilmore again. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I think uh, Mr. Allen had concluded his comments. Please go ahead, Ms. Gilmore. Uh, all right. Uh, well, maybe then Mr. Allen is not aware uh, that there is no technology to inspect the half-inch thick stainless steel canisters. It does not exist in, in the NRC uh, Spent Fuel Management uh, Division is planning to give um, PG&E and others five years to try and come up with a way to inspect even the surface for corrosion and, and for cracks. Uh, the, the problem is the canister must stay inside the concrete overpack cast, so, that, so it's uh, challenging to inspect it. There are no current tools that will work in that environment. So I'm a, I'm a little concerned that you have this optimism when the reality is those employees couldn't check that even if they wanted to. Well, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, the uh, specific uh, inspection uh, challenges that you've indicated. Uh, what I can do is uh, have our uh, Office of uh, Spent Fuel Storage and Transportation uh, reach out to you directly uh, to uh, answer uh, any questions uh, that you may have. I, I just apologize that I don't uh, have... I don't have, a, I don't have a question for them. I already have the answers. I've, I've, I've participated in, in uh, their technical meetings in July and August. I communicate with Mark Lombard and his staff, so I think it's more a matter of maybe um, it would be good for people involved in emergency planning and definitely people at um, PG&E, people to be aware of this. If you want, I can educate you on, the, on these issues, um, but you're, you, you know, I already have the information. Um, um, I have the uh, Department of Energy, so I have EPRI. Uh, presentations. I have uh, Department of Energy making uh, presentations about their finding the findings on the canisters, um, and, and you know. And my, if you want to just take a look at the August fifth uh, meeting minutes of that technical presentation, you will see it's right in there that they're giving them five years to try and come up with a way to inspect the exterior of these canisters. So I'm. Um, you know, I don't think I'm the one that needs educating here. And I'm very concerned that, that is, is anybody in this room, I can't see you, obviously. Is there anybody in this room that is aware of this issue? Well, I'll offer, uh, certainly if you've been engaging uh, Mark Lombard, that's the right person here. Uh, but I think... Uh, yeah, um, yes, but in terms of emergency response, it, 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 and I noticed that Humboldt Bay in December... Uh, was approved to eliminate all off-site emergency planning because everything is in dry cast now with the assumption that nothing is going to go wrong. Um, uh, if, you, if, the, if, you, if your group is the one that's approving those things, I'm concerned that maybe you're not aware of, of, these, um, of these, these relatively new uh, uh, findings about this. And who, who, who is the right person to talk about that part? Uh, this is, is Bob that, Kaler. Is that your group, the emergency? Yes, this huh? is Bob Kaler from NRC headquarters with uh, Emergency Preparedness Oversight. Um, with regard to the dry cast storage and emergency preparedness, the dry cast storage uh, casks themselves, there are emergency action levels in which classifications would be made upon their failure, regardless of whatever the trigger would be for the uh, for the release of uh, any radioactivity would come out of the dry cask. Uh, with regard to Humble Bay. Um, uh, even though, as, as you had stated, the off-site preparedness, radiological emergency preparedness, uh, was no longer a requirement, there's still on-site emergency preparedness requirements for those dry casts in which there would be classifications made upon their failure. So emergency preparedness does indeed address issues associated with um, dry cask and their, um, uh, any events that would, uh, that would happen with them. Is there some kind of a document uh, about that, that that I can read that's available that you're using to make your decisions on for, that would do, deal with the canisters? Well, it, it would be within um, the classification system uh, specific to the site. There is generic um, classification schemes that you can uh, you can find, and there are uh, Nuclear Energy Institute uh, documents. Uh, one in particular would be... Uh, All right, yeah. Uh, 9901 revision 6, 99 zero one revision 6, would include emergency action levels for um, 
ISFACI, as we call them, the dry cast storage facilities. What, what I think I hear you uh, saying, Ms. Gilmore, is that uh, uh, there are, uh, you would offer a degradation mechanism that uh, has been documented by uh, EPRI that uh, uh, we uh, don't have a means right now of inspecting uh, to determine whether that degradation is in fact occurring. And I certainly uh, do defer to you and your discussions with Mr. Lombard about that. I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of that particular uh, issue. I can just offer that uh, if the uh, program office uh, that is involved in reviewing dry cast storage designs uh, identifies a, a, a degradation mechanism that could result in uh, some type of release from the canister, uh, that would be communicated clearly to the regional offices and we would be conducting appropriate inspection and the licensee would be required to address that. Uh, what Mr. Kaler said is right now the emergency action scheme is based on some presumed, uh, uh, you know, uh, what would be the uh, uh, radiological footprint uh, that would occur if there was uh, known degradation of a cask and then those emergency action levels are a function of the degree of uh, 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 radiological impact uh, that would would result uh, to ensure that actions are taken to protect members of the public. Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm really uh, shocked at the uh, the level of disconnect between the different groups here. Maybe maybe there's some way we could you know have a meeting with the with the emergency planning folks and the. Um, uh, the, the the dry cast folks, the spectrum management folks, and and some of the public, and and kind of all get on the same page with this, and, and utility companies, of course, because um, I mean, if this information isn't isn't coming out, how could your emergency plans possibly deal with this? So, so I see a major disconnect that that needs to be addressed with something that we can maybe uh, um, have a, a follow up on on this issue. Well, I mean, offer you know, what's happened at Humboldt Bay is uh, because of the level of confidence that the emergency planners have that nothing's going to go wrong with those canisters. And they're also located, you know, right at the beach um, with, uh, you know, uh, the you know, same kind of, you know, Pacific Ocean salts there. Um, and those canisters are even much cooler, so they're more likely to have crack initiation uh, because of the humidity. And and yet, um, you, you've removed. They don't. Even, do they even have to notify the local and, and state officials? I noticed that, that, that you removed the requirement for how many minutes they had to notify the the local and state community. Is, is and that was taken out? Is it? Do they have to notify them at all? I don't know the uh, the answer to that specific question, but I can tell you in the case of San Onofre, in the case of Humboldt Bay, in the case of any other uh, decommissioning uh, reactor, that uh, if there is a desire to uh, change the emergency plan, uh, uh, that is reviewed and approved by the NRC via the exemption process. So when the fuel has been transferred to dry casks, we look at uh, you know what is the probability that there could be uh, 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 or the potential for there to be an accident at the cast that would result in some radiological release and then the emergency plan needs to be appropriate to ensure the protective actions that are provided in that circumstance. I think what you've communicated is that there is a technical issue that is being evaluated uh, regarding the potential degradation of the casks and what I was communicating is there has not been anything that has been communicated to us uh, from uh, Mr. Lombard's group that would say that the casks have this uh, potential uh, degradation mechanism that would result in some radiological release that previously hasn't been analyzed such that the emergency plan is deficient. There has not been any communication regarding that and it sounds like uh, the program office uh, of nuclear material safety and safeguards where Mr. Lombard works, they are an ongoing evaluation of that issue but there certainly hasn't been any safety concern communicated that would translate to the need for a different emergency plan. So in terms of the humble bay um who who i mean who who's like the person at the n r c that that would be like the top person that deals with that issue so if there if based on new information you needed to reevaluate that who's the decision maker on that issue at the n r c well 
there's not there is an office that has responsibility for the spent fuel uh, storage and transportation program. That's the office of that no, very no, title. No, no, I meant for emergency. I meant for the emergency planning, the one that approved uh, Humble Bay for not having to notify anybody outside the plant if something goes wrong. That's the uh, same. Who, that's the same office with input from the Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. But it would be uh, NMSS is the office that would uh, would evaluate the adequacy of the uh, uh, decommission. Uh, excuse me, the emergency plan associated with what a decommission facility. So, so that so that's Mark Lombard then. He is a senior manager. Yes, he is a senior manager. Uh, I believe he is the director of that uh, particular group. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So you go to him for that assessment then, or 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 he's his group is the one that basically gave Humboldt the exemption. I'm a little confused. Licensees submit an exemption request to the NRC, and there is a program office that would have responsibility in that area, which is the Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards, that would review that exemption request to determine whether there is any safety concern with NRC approval of that. So there is a program office at headquarters that would be responsible for that. The office director okay. is Kathy Haney, and the uh, Mark Lombard is a direct report to Kathy Haney, who has specific responsibility for spent fuel storage. Okay. All right. So I'll have lead back to Mark, it sounds like. Yeah, yes, and it, okay. it sounds like is that, you... Is that called a single point of failure? I'm sorry. I'm making a bad joke there. Oh. Did, did you have any uh, other uh, questions or uh, uh, comments? Uh, uh, yes. If, if one of those uh, canisters at Diablo, now, now that, that I'm aware that the odds are higher um, at Diablo... Uh, we don't know about the others because they haven't been checked for salts or anything. Um, what I'm more concerned, what is the plan of that, that canister was to crack? Do Dr. Singh, um, the president of Holtec, said those canisters can't be repaired, and he, and he owns the, you know, he's the president of the company. And he said that if there was a crack, a through wall crack in that half inch container, it would release millions of curie of uh, radi radiation into the environment. So my question is, what is a pg es plan if that were to happen? Well, I think you've cited uh, some particular conclusion that has been drawn by an individual here, uh, you know, without uh, understanding uh, the specific basis for that conclusion. We're not in a position to render any value judgment regarding the veracity of that conclusion. Uh, uh, okay, that's that's fine, but, but, but if there is a crack in the canister, what is the emergency plan? What is PG&E's plan to deal with? with a failed canister that's cracked all the way through. That, they would have to have some kind of plan, right? They do have an emergency plan that would address a situation. And, and what would that be for a cracked canister? It, this is Bob Kaler again. Um, emergency preparedness and even with regard to the dry cast storage um, itself uh, does not uh, go to the to the point of determining what the um, impetus is for the release of radioactivity it deals with the with the outcomes such that we have done studies to to determine what that radioactive footprint would be and we have determined that that emergency action level I was talking about which would uh, render a classification no higher than an alert would uh, not release radioactivity that would have any impact upon public health and safety outside of the uh, plant site itself so, but the emergency re preparedness plan would respond to that classification level, as well as some offsite agencies uh, with 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 regard to the alert classification, regardless of the initiating event, uh, what caused that cask to fail, and that's what I was trying to say before. We don't we don't go to what's the cause of the cracking of the cask or the release of radioactivity from the cask, but what could be the plausible radioactive footprint from it, and it would be a classification level of no higher than alert. So the emergency plan okay, does is that, address. Is that, is that in some kind of uh, document that's available that we could have? 
What it, it's just it, it is it is part of the emergency preparedness plan for response to the classification level of an alert. So anything that you would well, see, so that, I mean, in terms in terms of determining that classification level for the the PG&E canisters, where, where is that documented? That would be specific to the plant site, and um, it would be up to the plant site to provide it or not. So you guys but don't I look said at that. But the generic, but the generic, the generic classification uh, scheme that it would be based upon is the document I had previously stated, which was that Nuclear Energy Institute NEI 99-01 Revision 6, which is available on our public website. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Gilmer, you, okay, thank you. You, you made a comment that we don't look at that. Yes, we do look at that. We look at the emergency plan associated with any decommissioned okay. facility or any operating facility. Um, I, I do appreciate the uh, extensive dialogue we've had with you. Um, um, it was my understanding from the operator uh, that that was the last uh, question. Uh, I, I did want to uh, make sure that Mr. Hoffman, he had asked for an email uh, for further communications. And uh, Mr. Hoffman, are you still on? Mr. Hoffman, if you'd like your line to be open, press star one. Well, we'll attempt to reach out to Mr. Hoffman and get him the uh, email address uh, uh, so that he could forward any comments. Uh, operator, do we have any other uh, questions from uh, members of the public? I do see um, a question coming through, just a moment here. Oh, we have a couple, actually. Um, Ace Hoffman, I'll go ahead and open up your line. Your line is open, sir. Yeah, thank you, yes. I only wanted to say that I think that was Ray Lutz that asked for the email address. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Hoffman, my apology. Sir, no problem. Okay, and we do have a couple more questions. Did you want to take those? Yeah, we'll take questions uh, here uh, for about another uh, 12 minutes here. Uh, uh, we had advertised the original length of this regulatory conference, uh, including the question and answer period from uh, 1 to 4 Central, and we're now approaching uh, 5.30, and I certainly want to be responsive to questions from members of the public, uh, uh, but uh, we'll take questions uh, for uh, another uh, uh, 12 minutes. Okay, our next question comes from Don Lightning from Citizens Oversight. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. I was the one that asked for the email address, not Ray Lutz, but we both work at, we both support Citizens Oversight, so I'd be happy to hear the email address. And I was really excited to uh, hear that Donna Gilmore got on the phone because she is an expert in cast storage, although she doesn't work for the NRC, and uh, you folks would be well advised to uh, uh, try to interact with her because she knows what she's talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me give you the uh, uh, email address. It's uh, O is in Oscar, P is in Paul, A is in Apple, 4 dot resource at NRC dot gov. Okay. Thank you very much. I got it. Uh, operator, do we, we have you, sorry, do we have another question? Yes. It comes from Patricia Borschman. Your line is open. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. And I appreciate uh, the, pre t the telephone conference call and opportunity for public participation. So far, it's been, I'm, I'm, it's been impressive. So um, I'm, I'm happy to participate. I'm, I live in Southern California. I live in San Diego County. I wanted to just bring up the point that um, there's activities underway that are being expedited by uh, and accelerated uh, by Southern California Edison, who's the licensee at San Onofre. So they are um, undertaking a decommissioning plan. They've already processed and prepared their PSDAR, their uh, radiated fuel management plan, et cetera, and have developed a cost estimate. Uh, citizens in Southern California are very concerned about public safety because um, many analysts, independent analysts, believe that the type of cast design that they're proposing here is only an interim uh, cast design and, a, and an inferior compared to 
other cast designs uh, that provide more durability, longer lifetimes, and more protective features. Um, the public is interested in um, asking the NRC to take a position to represent us in, in, in the manner that would give us greater assurance of public public safety, ongoing public safety. So um, in the NEPA, in the Federal Environmental Quality Act, there's uh, requirements that um, certain levels of mitigation be provided. In, uh, in this case, I think it would be appropriate for NRC to uh, formally endorse a level of protection that's the best the best available control technology for, for cast designs. I think that typically um, agencies have different level choices, and Edison, I think, is choosing uh, a cheaper, uh, a less expensive uh, alternative. And I understand their interest um, in, you know, doing this as quickly as possible, and I understand there's a lot of uh, differing opinions, you know, so some people want it to go faster, some some uh, communities want it to slow down, et cetera. Um, I'm interested in having it slow down because I think this is going to be a huge investment that is just good. they're just going to have to buy it twice. Um, and I'm, since we're aware that there's better cast designs available with features that can allow uh, st stored, stored waste to be transferred um, from wet, wet storage to dry storage. There's a lot of um, technical components and complexities here. Um, anyway, the, the current plan that Edison is expediting, and uh, it's just going too fast, and they're going to be uh, getting approval real quickly, and I think that someone at NRC needs to uh, gear up and become more involved at this point before before it's finalized. Well, I want to thank you for your comments, uh, and uh, you know I, I know this was a regulatory conference uh, in connection with the Oblo Canyon and protective action recommendations over the ocean, and uh, I think we've done our yeah. best to address a broad spectrum of questions that are not just specific to that aspect, and I certainly uh, w would like to comment uh, on your uh, question uh, specific to uh, San Onofre, and uh, uh, I know that uh, the licensee is uh, looking at uh, what is the uh, particular cask vendor that they choose to use. I think they've even announced that. Um, we look at that and have to license uh, that for uh, uh, approval there. I, and I don't know if that is a cask design that we have already reviewed and approved, but the licensee will not be able to use any cask design that has not been reviewed and uh, approved in a safety context uh, by the NRC. Uh, that's a requirement. Uh, so there are, there are different cask vendors that uh, um, um, you know, uh, the, and the cost of the cast may be clearly different uh, depending on the vendor that you choose, but any uh, vendor that is chosen by the licensee has to use a cask that has been reviewed and approved uh, by the NRC. I understand. Um, it's a timing issue. The NRC's level of review is um, that level of site specific level of review won't apply until after. Uh, until the permits for decommiss full decommissioning at San Onofre is already approved. What we're saying is we need that site-specific level of review at the front end. We don't need it at the back end. You know, so this prolonged storage issue at San Onofre, I know last August um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission authorized prolonged, indefinitely prolonged, uh, on-site storage of waste in dry cast storage and transfer of fuel. There's, uh, there's pending issues here that are just enormous, and uh, they haven't been fully resolved. And I think Edison is painting a picture that's overly optimistic about the levels of uh, their, their capabilities, the, their their extent of experience. Um, there's there's just so many uncertainties in, uh, involved here, and so many important choices. And Edison has 
brought this to the public after it's already been cooked. Uh, you know, like it's like seventy five percent done. And so the public has not been involved at the front end. So that's what is partially what people are concerned about. Well, you know, they've already told, uh, you know, what type of container. They've already made those choices. And those should have been part of the public participation process, we think. No, I, I, I appreciate your comment there. Uh, uh, I do know of the uh, community engagement uh, panel that uh, uh, Southern California Edison has uh, initiated, yeah. and there are various individuals that are, uh, are uh, representing uh, local stakeholder interests on that engagement panel. Um, uh, but what I would offer here, because I can't speak to the specific uh, site review that you're commenting on, I just don't have the expertise here uh, in the room to address that question. And so I was going to offer if, uh, and I can repeat it, if you could uh, send your uh, question or comment to uh, this uh, email address, uh, I'll make sure uh, that we get the right folks from our program office uh, uh, back in touch with you to address your concerns with the uh, site-specific review, because I'm not aware of uh, what you're referring to, uh, and I apologize for that. Thank you so much. Uh, do, do, do you need the uh, email address, or did you get that uh, when I uh, commented uh, to, uh, regarding... Um, um, uh, I can get it from uh, any of the colleagues. I can get it from Donna Gilmore. So. Oh. Okay. No need to repeat it. I'll get it. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, operator, do we have any uh, other questions from members of the public? I am showing no other questions. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, those members of the public and government officials that are still on the phone that uh, uh, participated and uh, f uh, provided your questions. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I, I do think uh, that that uh, exchange was done in a very professional manner, and I know that we people have different views and perspectives, and I uh, respect uh, those views and, and uh, appreciate the manner in which uh, those were offered and the uh, questions and comments uh, that were provided by the individuals that participated. So. Uh, Thank you, and uh, operator, with that, uh, we're concluding the uh, question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may now disconnect at this time. Have a wonderful day.